when Maureen Lipman will be chairing the team in place of Julie Covington. Uh, listeners may be interested to know that the original Housewives' Choice signature tune and Julie Covington's vocal version are now available on an album, cassette and CD on the BBC Radio 2 label, along with several of the most requested songs from the time. The album is entitled When Housewives Had the Choice. And about- <laughs> It's the A to Z of politics, starring June Whitfield, Kenneth Connor, and William Franklin. Hello and welcome to the A to Z, where we give you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Really? No, I was lying. (laughs) Quite appropriate, since this week we're looking at politics. Yes, and A is for abolition. Politicians like to abolish things. Slavery, drink, other politicians. (laughs) B is for broadcasts, as in party political. An opportunity for the whole country... To go and make a cup of tea. And B is also for the budget. Oh, um, uh... Darling. Yes, darling? Um, I know you're the Chancellor of the Exchequer and everything, and I'm just a sort of normal, slightly scatty, absent-minded, but adorable Chancellor's wife. Yes, darling? Well, you know that battered old red briefcase you keep on the hall table? Yes, darling? And you know the Boy Scouts came to the door just now and said, had we any rubbish? (laughs) Yes? Well, I I was just wondering... For carrying your dreadfully important budget speech to the house next time. Yeah? Would a Tesco's carrier bag do? <laughs> C is for communists. People who want to put the country's wrongs to rights by using other people's money. C is for conservatives. People who want to put the country's wrongs to rights by using other people's money. <laughs> D. D is for Downing Street. A place in London which offers temporary accommodation to senior politicians until they can find themselves a proper job. (laughs) E is for elections. I once stood for Parliament, you know. Oh, really, Bill? Did you get elected? Oh, yes, easily. Oh, how wonderful. Did you have to work terribly hard? Why, should I have done? (laughs) I suppose it is usual. What was the House of Commons like? What House of Commons? The place in in London where they run the country from. Keep going. This is fascinating. (laughs) Good heavens. Didn't anybody ever ask you to go and take your seat in the House? Well, I did get lots of letters marked OHMS, but I threw them all away. I thought they were just income tax demands. How long ago was this? About 15 years. Well. Fancy not doing anything for your constituency for 15 years. No wonder you lost your seat at the next election. Oh, I didn't. (laughs) F is for filibuster. The ploy of jabbering on for hours and hours without a hope of getting anything worthwhile decided. See also L for local councils. F is for foreign affairs. What a politician has when he goes abroad. (laughs) G is for government, an effective way of running a country. G is for guillotine, a really effective way of running a country. H is for hung parliament, what everyone would like to have done to the people who run the country. H is for the House of Lords. Yeah. 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 Here we are. Oh, oh susnettably so dimly conscious. <laughs> and Lord Courtney Act. Yeah. Oh, do sit down, you daft old sludge boxes. <laughs> oh, sit down. Oh, yes, 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 thank you. Just a moment. Where's my rubber ring? <laughs> Now, I've got you in the House of Lords before the session starts because the Prime Minister (laughs) wants us to think of a way to show everyone that this place isn't populated by a load of silly old dobbers. Oh, good idea. Don't you agree, Snatterby? Half past three. (laughs) What 
to get our act together. We've got to show the kids we can boogie on down. We've got to pump up the jam and get hot to the beat on the street. Man. <laughs> what on earth are you on about, Courtney, you leather-lined fruit basket? <laughs> it's rap talk, Marjorie. Well, the only rap you're likely to get is one on the knuckles. <laughs> I'm a bit of a Billy Fury fan, Miss <laughs> I, I say, who's that over there? Where? A silly old woman in the purple dress. That is the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> well, he must be terribly upset. He's really wringing his hands. The Lord Chancellor looks a bit upset, too. Uh, I wonder why. It's his neck the Archbishop's wringing his hands. <laughs> I know. Perhaps we should think up some racy pasts for all of us. <laughs> That'll set the punters thinking. Oh, yes. <laughs> I could tell the papers I'm Barbara Cartland's secret love child. <laughs> Nonsense. They wouldn't believe you. Oh, I'm, I'm too young, you think. <laughs> here we go, here we go, here we go. I see the Labour peers are arriving. Well, at least they're giving the place a bit of life. You know, what we really need to shake this dump up is a Wedgwood Ben. I've got a Royal Dalton one. <laughs> but Lady Marjorie, why on earth does the PM want us to change? Oh, because of that fiasco last night. Oh, what does she say? Bit of a rum do here last night. Rum? Oh, lovely. Oh, the vote in the House of Lords, you dwillock. I remember back in 54, now there really was a flood. What is he on about now? I'm thatchered, if I know. What are you on about now, you drowsy impediment? Last time there was a boat in the House of Lords. Vote, you corrugated twonk. <laughs> uh, you're not expected to vote against the government if you're the chief whip. Who oh, is? You are. I'm afraid your one vote, Snetterby, was enough to swing a decision against the government. With a me woolsack. Uh, did anybody notice? Oh, no, not really. Only the Prime Minister, the Cabinet, both Houses of Parliament, the World's Press, and one or two other people, collectively known as the entire population of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Yes, but apart from them, <laughs> was the Prime Monster upset? <laughs> Well, the Prime Minister did send you a little message. I mean, how did it go again, Annie? Oh, oh, yes, you're fired. Well, that's very unfair. If you ask me, there's someone else to blame over this business entirely. Really? And who might that be? This government cheap whip chap you keep talking about. <laughs> 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 Eye is for interviews, the politician's art of listening carefully and considerately to an interviewer's question, and then giving the answer to a completely different one. <laughs> J is for junior ministers a species of politician performing a useful function in the running of a country. See also S for scapegoats. <laughs> J is for justice. Justice has absolutely nothing to do with politics. And we don't know what it's doing here. K is for kissing babies. A politician does this for three reasons. A, he wants to be elected. B, he wants to stay elected. And C, is Cecil Parkinson. <laughs> K is for the Kremlin. Now, this is the place of power in Moscow, from which the Soviet Union runs its economy. As we know, the Soviet Union's economy depends almost entirely upon one thing. The KGB. No, the beetroot. A small, seemingly insignificant red object. L is for the Labour Party. A small, seemingly insignificant red object. M is for ministers. People who look after the departments of state that handle the way the country is run. Or, put another way, the people responsible for all the misery in the world. M is for the mace. You find this in the British Parliament. The best way to get rid of it is to put down mace traps. M is for Maggie. Mrs. Thatcher. Greetings, mortals. <laughs> I just wanted to say a few words and cheer you all up a bit. But I can't really do both, can I? <laughs> well, can I take you into my confidence for just a moment? No, please do let me finish. I feel there's something missing from my life. 
It's a country seat. I mean, Churchill had Chartwell, Douglas Home had his Scots ancestral Hume. <laughs> and even Kinnock tells me he's got a country seat. Well, between you and me, it's a three-bedroom semi in Ealing, but you've got a humour, Freckles, haven't you? <laughs> well, everyone else does. So, where are my rolling acres? Well, yes, all right, I do have my Barrett's extravaganza in Dulwich, but... As I'm not expecting to retire until 2095, <laughs> it'll probably have fallen down by then. Now, do you know, the other day, I was in the throne room at Buckingham Palace, trying it out for size, you know, as one does, <laughs> when Mrs. Windsor walked in. <laughs> well, I mean, really, fancy being named after a soup. <laughs> You know, it's all a lot of nonsense to say that she and I don't get on. We do. We get on like a husband, Dan. Anyway, I asked her if she'd like to bung me one of her homes. I mean, she's got so many. Save on the poll tax for a start, I said. Oh, certainly, she said. She said I could have some place called the Falklands. <laughs> well, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> The generosity of the woman. I only wish I could remember where I'd heard of the place before. <laughs> anyway, I must dash now. I won't keep you. I've got to go home and pour Dennis's dinner. Goodbye. <laughs> N is for Nobel, the prize every politician hankers after. O is for Oscar, the prize every politician deserves. <laughs> o is for opposition. This is the official title of those people who do not agree with the way a government runs the country. See also E for the entire population. <laughs> P is for Parliament. A place where duly elected MPs go for a cheap drink and a nice nap. <laughs> P is for political parties. These are held once or twice a week. <laughs> Q is for Queen. She is the most loved and respected person in the whole of the United Kingdom. Which is why she keeps well clear of politics. <laughs> Q is for quorum. Decisions are made by these. Whenever three or more people gather together, then they're allowed to make a decision. Which is why the SDP haven't made any yet. <laughs> R is for revolution. A way of changing things when every other form of politics has failed. It has been perpetrated by such dangerous ideological fanatics as Leon Trotsky, Che Guevara and Paddy Ashdown. R is for respect, a word used by politicians as in, with great respect, Minister, I beg to differ, which roughly translated means... Naff off, Baldy. <laughs> S is for the social and liberal Democrats, a group of people left over from other parties. <laughs> And like anyone who's left over after another party, <laughs> you just wish they'd leave so that you can go to bed and turn the lights on. S is for South American politics. Oh. oh, the heat, the flies. This is worse than waiting to be served in a spud you like. <laughs> I wish I'd brought that deodorant that gives you a tick on your back now. Hot day, lady. Don't move. We got you surrounded. No, don't shoot. Uh, uh, Peradua ad astra, quad erat demonstrandum, a pluribus unum gringo. I see you speak Latin American. My name's Kate Hades. I'm a reporter. I'm out here for the Daily Mail. Is that a paper or a fantasy? Well, lady, if you're here to cover the revolution, it's too late. This is the new president. Uh, hiya, Tuts. I'm Generalissimo Groucho P. Grattle, chairman of the Green Party. This is my right-hand man, Pedro. And this is my left-hand man, unleaded Pedro. <laughs> Hasta banana, Santana. Oh, well, congratulations, Presidente. I bet there'll be celebrations tonight. Sure, there'll be fiestas in the Sierras and hatchbacks in the Granadas. <laughs> Tell me, was it a terribly difficult struggle? Oh, si, si, si. I'm very lonely. Up here in the mountains where there are only senors. And the senoritas. Ah, oh, yes, dark-eyed Latin beauties. And that's just the men. <laughs> there are no women here. But you just said there were senoritas. Si, si, si. The mountain lions. Boy, are they senoritas. <gasps> <laughs> Have you had...
had much foreign aid? Sure, the Americanas sold us this four-wheel difficult drive terrain vehicle. Jeep? Well, it was no bargain. <laughs> Now, if you don't mind, it's time I had a revolution to take over the country. But you're the president. You already run the country. I know, and I don't like the way I'm doing it. <laughs> Just before you go, who sold you the uniforms, man, at CNA? See, si, see, si, we look like the revolutionaries, eh? Well, with those drainpipe trousers, the crepe-soled shoes, and the brill-creamed hair, no, you look more like teddy boys. Yeah, well, we modeled ourselves on a great revolutionary leader of the 50s. Here's his photograph. That's a picture of Bill Haley. See, si, see, si, you heard of Che Guevara? Yes. Well, this is Che Grottle and Roll. <laughs> T is for trade union. There are two types of trade union leaders. One is practicing and the other is retired. What's the difference? Well, one despises the establishment, the old boy network, and any form of archaic traditional values. And the other? Is a member of the House of Lords. <laughs> U is for the USSR, a massive, ungainly, self-opinionated country of largely one political point of view, where presidential elections are usually a foregone conclusion. See also the USA. <laughs> v is for voting. Now then, Mr. Pugely, I've been a teller a lot longer than you have. Nobody ever lets you know which way they've actually voted, so you take your cue from me, all right? Right. All right, all right. here we go. Um... Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, may we ask how you voted? SDP. <laughs> Thank you. I'll put him down as a don't know. Morning, madam. May I ask how you voted? Well, I honestly can't tell. Social and liberal Democrat. Uh, morning, sir. May I ask how you voted? Tory. Labour. <laughs> Good morning, sir. May I ask how you voted? Mind your own business. Conservative. W is for war. A democratic process not unlike the meeting of the Lambeth Council. X is a sign used in elections to register an opinion. See also V. Y is for yes. A word now extinct in politics. There are three substitutes. Maybe... We'd better refer it to a committee. And what's it worth to me? <laughs> and finally, Z is for that which is heard during all political debates and party conferences. We present Not a Penny More or Less Among Equals, Abel, by Geoffrey Archer. Not those archers. Sorry. The time is the present. It's time for a present, and everybody is having a present time. In the corridors of power of Westminster, something is stirring. A civil servant with a teaspoon. <laughs> Meanwhile, behind one of the doors, a great power struggle is going on. Oh, oh, all right, you win. See? You're the bestest arm wrestling home secretary we've ever had. I knew you'd see it my way. He smiled and wiped his hand on an exquisite linen handkerchief in the corner of which were the initials D.H. Who are you talking to? <laughs> the readers. Eh? Yes, the initials D.H. standing for Dirk Handsome, the dashing, daring, good-looking, manly home secretary... <laughs> Dirk looked across the desk at his colleague, Steve Putrid. <laughs> How's the technology contract coming along? Well, I think there's a mole in the department. Now, don't talk to me. Talk to Rentacure. <laughs> no, I mean, someone seems to be getting hold of our, our most brilliant secret technological inventions and passing them on to the West German. Dirk sat back in his leather armchair. Oh, God, he's off again. <laughs> he inspected the inside of his phenomenal mind. It was brilliant. Everything he'd ever done had been brilliant. He played cricket, rugby and football for England. He'd got three straight firsts at Cambridge and two slightly curly firsts at Oxford. <laughs> Not only that, but he could gargle all Jason Donovan's hits in the bath. Steve Putrid was pretty hot stuff, too. I beg your pardon? I just thought that since you were giving yourself such a good write-up that I would... This is my action-packed adventure, not yours. 
Dirk leaned across and glowered at Steve Putrid, five foot tall on the same height lying down. Oi! He speaks in a silly, high-pitched voice. Oi, cut that out! And he had a pathetic, wispy moustache and a silly red face that made him look like Bonnie Langford with sunburn. <laughs> Oh, come on. It's my story. Well, at least give us a decent speaking voice. Oh, all right. Steve, although looking like something Edwina Curry dragged in, <laughs> had a pretty boring, normal sort of uninteresting voice. Well, that's something, at least. <clears throat> now, about this West German business. My department thinks the leak is happening in your neck of the woods. What? Uh. <laughs> so you're not so brilliant after all. Shut mm, up. Yeah, well, in fact... <laughs> You must have been pretty stupid to have let an industrial mole into your department in the first place. Shut up twice. In fact, I go as far as to say... Chapter two. <laughs> Dirk Handsome had dined well. Yes, and what's more... And Steve Putrid was nowhere to be seen. Yeah. In fact, he was in Glasgow. <laughs> you rat! But Dirk was not alone. At his table sat beautiful, sultry, temptress Selina Goodenough... He'd just finished telling her a brilliantly witty story. <laughs> <laughs> they laughed, and then they had a snog. No, they didn't. Oh, go on. No. Oh, all right. They just laughed, then. Yes, that's fine. Although Selina was absolutely besotted with his winning ways. What winning ways? You said you bung me 200 quid if I come out with you. Shh. He remembered how they'd first met. He was just on his way to the Prime Minister's office with his latest idea to replace cars with vehicles that ran on used pot noodles. <laughs> when he'd found Selina rummaging through his desk. Oh, uh, uh, She'd obviously been looking for some memento of her handsome hero. Uh, absolutely. And now, reaching the end of their meal, she was starting to delight in his company. Well, go on, delight in my company. Oh, good. <clears throat> oh, but Dirk. You're so handsome and dashing and good-looking and... What's this word say? Debonair. Debonair. You're simply the most exciting man in Westminster. Yes, I am. Dirk gazed into those deep blue eyes, the tan skin, those pert little lips. Oh, excuse me, sir. Will you be wanting anything else or going to be content to stare at his reflection in the ice bucket? <laughs> That will be all, Mario. Thank you, Charles. Uh, hang on a mo. Mario. That's German, isn't it? No, sir. No. Well, it's foreign, at least. You haven't by any chance been stealing top-secret secrets, have you? No, sir. Dirk eyed him suspiciously, his keen, incisive brain working overtime. Suddenly, he noticed the sheaf of top-secret government papers sticking out of Mario's jacket pocket. Aha! What is it, Dirk? This chap with the German-sounding name, he's got my secret papers. Oh, don't be a burp, Dirk. <laughs> Please, senor. And um, what's more, those papers are going to stay found in his pocket unless... Unless what, senor? Unless there's no charge for this meal. Oh, oh see, see, senor, yes. Absolutely no charge for a meal. It's on the house. Dirk smiled. And the papers in the waiter's pocket suddenly disappeared. Later that night, in bed with Selena. No. In the shower with Selena. No. Sitting quietly on the sofa in Selena's apartment, having coffee and listening peacefully to Selena's favourite composer, Wagner. That will do. So, um. Dirk, you got any secrets you wish to tell me? Well, I once had an imaginary gerbil called Nigel. <laughs> no, I'm talking about government secrets. Ah, well, did you know that the PM has okayed a new form of public transport that will save this country millions? I just need the bedroom slipping into something more comfortable, like a typewriter, darling. All right, you. Come here. Ow! Let go of my arm! It's okay, Dirk. I've caught her red-handed. Let go of me! Steve, I thought you were in Glasgow. I started my own book. <laughs> I've got this really hunky voice now and I look twice as good as you do But this is my story Yeah, yeah, that's right, Dirk Go on, write me free Dirk Handsome suddenly realising that he'd been the unwitting source of the political leaks was so ashamed he took a gun Look out, and... Dirk, you've got a gun Dirk took the gun and pointed it at Steve Then he pointed it back at himself Then he pointed it at Steve again <laughs> Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> Come on, Dirk Shut up, you! Suddenly, Selina ran out of the flat, never to be seen again. Ah! She 
just gone forever. You swine! Just for that! And Steve Putrid joined her. But not before he'd grabbed Dirk Handsome and taken him with him. <laughs> and so it was that Dirk Handsome vanished from the political scene and was never to write anything decent ever again, which became a successful West End play. Steve Putrid ended up as a chat show host on Sky Television, so he's never been seen since either. <laughs> Selena Goodenough got arrested by a special branch, sold her memoirs to a newspaper, became very famous and went into politics. Which is, of course, where you get the expression, if you've Selena one, you've Selena all. Thank you and goodbye. You've been listening to The A to Z of Politics, starring June Whitfield, Kenneth Connor, and William Franklin. It was written by Martin Booth and produced by Paul Spencer. Next Tuesday, at this time, we examine The A to Z of Sport. June Whitfield, William Franklin, and Kenneth Connor start probably with the three A's, I would imagine, and end who knows where. And while we're looking ahead... Here's one of our bargains you may well wish to snap up. You'll no doubt have heard either on Thursday nights or Saturday lunchtimes for news headlines. You may even have thought you'd like to be in the audience at its recording, but not have been available at lunchtime. Well, here comes the good news. We have a recording of a headline special review of the 80s, and it's going to be in an evening on the 9th of December at the Paris studio, Lower Regent Street, London, starting at 7.30. If you'd like a ticket or two, there are still some left. You should write to the radio ticket unit, BBC London, W1A, 4 WW. And please enclose a stamped address envelope and say how many tickets you'd like. The Hudlines Review of the 80s on the 9th of December. This Friday, meanwhile, at 10.30, our situation comedy Living with Betty continues, starring Barbara Windsor, Peter Salis and Glyn Edwards. I was thinking that this house is too big for us now. Why is that, my angel? Has it grown? Do you know, Harold, sometimes I ring the speaking clock just to hear someone say something sensible. <laughs> No comment. 10.30, Friday, Living with Betty. Radio 2. We present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Colin Sell, and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello, and welcome to a new series of I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. And for the next ten weeks, at this time, I can promise you laughs all the way. But for them, you'll have to reach you now to Radio 3. <laughs> Meanwhile, sitting on my right, we have Tim Brooke Taylor and Willie Rushton. And on my left, Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. 